Thank you for tuning in to Acti Global's Fireside Chat with Anouk Whipreck. I'm Amanda Terry, your host and creator of this Fireside Chat series, and we're very excited to have her here today. Um, Anouk is a true artist and innovator. Um, she's a pioneer in the field of fashion tech and is basically combining fashion design with engineering, science, and interactive human experience design. She's produced an impressive body of tech enhanced designs, bringing together fashion and technology in beautiful and unusual ways. Um, she creates technological couture with systems around the body that actually tend towards artificial intelligence. Projected as host systems on the human body, her designs move, breathe, and react to the environment and to the wearer's thoughts. Um, she combines the latest in science and technology to make fashion an experience that transcend, transcends mere appearances. Sensors embedded in the design monitor the space around the wearer, and then body sensors check in on stress levels to determine the wearer's comfort or anxiety. So it's kind of the perfect dress uh, in these times for, uh, to practice social distancing. Um, her latest design, which she'll talk about today, the pangolin dress, was featured on the cover of the Independence Lifestyle section last week. So I'll let her share more details on this, um, but wanted to give first a, a brief overview um, of who Acti is for those of you who may not know us. And then uh, Bill will just give a brief intro to Nuke and then we'll get right into it. And um, I think uh, in terms of uh, the plan is that she will be presenting for you know, roughly 30 to 40 minutes and then we should have plenty of time for Q&A. So um, if you have questions, um, please get those ready. And if you are camera ready and wanna come on, we would love to turn on your camera and have you ask them to her directly. Um, so Acti Global is a nonprofit and community of athletes, conservationists, technologists, artists, and innovators that bring our combined energy, social capital, and financial support of our members to support two main goals, environmental conservation and economic empowerment via entrepreneurship. We've established a marine conservation area around the Brolos Islands off Western Australia in support of Missions Blue Hope Spot program and supported active conservation efforts to pr protect marine life with the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society and many other nonprofits. We've also helped conceptualize a technology framework in support of the 2030 vision and a data science foundation for the Ocean Plastics Leadership Network. In support of our second goal of economic empowerment via entrepreneurship, we created the Extreme Tech Challenge five years ago, fueling companies aligned with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, in addition to catalyzing gatherings, including the West Tech Fest and the Necker Blockchain Summit. We're also key advisors on technology for the UNICEF Giga Connect project to bring broadband to every school in the world. Um, Acti was also partner in the formative stages of the 2030 Vision Project to bring technology and multi-stakeholder partnerships to solve for the 17 United Nations Sustainability Goals. And in the coming months, we'll be helping to drive educational programs for the UN in support of the UN Joint Fund, Joint SDG Fund to catalyze private and public partnerships and the UNDP Accelerator Labs program to provide a platform for the creation of new companies across the 40 nations where the UNDP has established technology accelerators. So we're really excited about a lot of the work that we'll be doing in partnership with the UN. Um, I think we've given people enough time to get settled in. Just a couple housekeeping notes. Um, first of all, you know, anything that you put in the chat will not be part of the final recording, but will be seen to, uh, by the panelists and um, the other people on the webinar. Um, and again, I encourage everyone to get your questions ready. And you know, for any of you logged in on the Zoom app, you'll see the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. So you can click that button and ask your question or, and I'll, and I'll ping you separately. And if you wanna come on live, we'd love to you know, ask you to unmute, turn on your camera and ask it directly uh, to Anouk. Um, and if for some reason you're having some issues with Zoom and you're just calling in off a phone, um, you can also just email us questions at fireside at acti, A-C-T-A-I dot global. And with that, I want to turn it over to Bill. Maybe you can say a couple words. Um, about yeah, so thank you for that description, Amanda. And, uh, and on a bunch of those projects, you know, the, the UN related things are really ramping up. And whether it's the Giga, Giga Connect project, the joint SDG fund, and or 
the stuff we're doing with UNDP Accelerator Labs, all of them need help. And um, we are a great channel for volunteers. If you guys want to get involved with the UN, uh, reach out to Amanda. Um, on Anouk, she is totally representative of a couple of the letters in our acronym ACTI. If you think about artists and innovators in that in that munge of athletes, conservationists, technologists, artists, and innovators, she is like state of the art and working with so many uh, wonderful companies that you'll see in in some of her presentation. Um, I actually got to see her in person. And everything has a kiteboarding story, but she has been an artist and an innovator artist in residence for Autodesk and that entire Pier 9 facility that is like a prototyping lab with all kinds of things. She was showing me how to cut steel with water and all kinds of interesting <laughs> things that I never got to experience um, in person until then. That entire setup was built out because of a, a kiteboarder that came out from MIT with the group that formed Squid Labs. He open sourced a bunch of kite designs to become instructables. And then that got acquired by Autodesk. And then he's been in charge of that whole facility for years. So if you ever want to go visit, uh, just reach out to Eric Wilhelm. He, he was part of our early kite expeditions in, I think, 20 years ago. So uh, part of the crew, too. Uh, but with that, Anouk, take it away. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, let me see. I am going to share my screen here. Uh -huh and pop up my first slide um i think my first slide should be visible now correct yeah perfect yeah amazing thank you so much for the invites um yeah i know some of you i know uh bill from a few occasions uh ocean gala uh, our pr9 visit which was really fun and um yeah it's just an it's just a great uh, community i met some of you guys in, uh, in australia as well and martin and all um so yeah, so um, yeah, Amanda already told some things about me. Uh, I'm a fashion tech designer, so I combine uh, fashion and technology on the body. I'm from the Netherlands, but I uh, live at the moment in uh, Florida, in the Miami area. Uh, so might you be in this area? Uh, let me know. We just moved a year ago, so we're just exploring all the new stuff. I love the architecture of uh, Miami and all the design. I love the makers in Orlando, uh, all of that stuff. So it's, in a, it's a cute area. So if you want to uh, yeah, follow me or reach out, uh, my name is Hannah Gripta. You can find me on uh, Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter. And also if you have a question, uh, feel free to uh, push the Q&A uh, button uh, if there's a question from you guys. So uh, in regards to my uh, design and my uh, process, um, I do a lot um, with uh, yeah, the body and the spaces around the body. So what you can see here is the intimate space, the personal space, the social space, and um, also the, the public space. And all these spaces have different uh, kind of measurements. Um, this is the proximic theory of Edward T. Hall, uh, who in the 60s, he was um, doing a lot of research regarding to these spaces. He was traveling around um, himself a lot, and he was noticing that different cultures and different people have different spaces. And he was uh, measuring that with a stick with an, uh, a wooden stick and uh, I, I was totally fascinated in the beginning of 2000 with all of this I started uh, pretty young with fashion uh, I was 14 years old with couture and tailoring and then I, um, I discovered robotics when I was 17 years old and uh, I loved robots for the uh, yeah sort of for the intelligence and everything I, w I wanted to combine that back to my, uh, my yeah my designs so in the beginning of 2000 I was doing a lot of that um, there were not that many girls in technology at that time uh, technology was also very big uh, so not always that uh, that sexy sort of, you know, so we're living in a really nice world that we can uh, use a lot of cool technologies now. So one of the technologies that I'm using is uh, proximity sensors and I am using ultrasonic rangefinders. So where Edward T. Hall in his time in the 60s was measuring things with an analog stick, I'm doing that uh, by the use of these sensors now and my sensors are measuring 25 feet. And um, how you can see that, for example, this is one of the dresses that I could create at uh, Intel, the semiconductor company. I was working at Portland and um, I was working with Intel Edison. So it was their uh, little micro module that uh, I based this dress on. So you see in the frontal part, in those, uh, those black balls here um, uh, are hosted the ultrasonic rangefinders and they measure 25 feet. So when somebody steps in the personal space of this dress, um, the dress is also equipped with mechanics on the shoulder. So when you step in this uh, personal space, the dress is basically uh, attacking you and protecting your personal space. So that's one of my uh, favorite dresses because I think uh, it's just really cool to have a system on your body that does that kind of like communication or protection. 
so here you can see a little bit of the functioning of the um, of those mechanics. And um, I did something with this notion of not only sensing it, um, also um, projecting something, something that I call 12 states of behavior. So depending on when you walk to this dress, it's reacting differently. So when you walk up very fast, very close by, it's much more aggressive than when you're on a more gentleman or gentlewoman uh, space from this design, for example. All the technology is uh, in the back, so you can see the back piece there. Uh, you can see the mechanic uh, servo-based uh, legs, and also it has a proximity sensor. Um, I didn't find it fair that it was always attacking, so she can breathe in and breathe out, and the system goes into a sleepy mode, um, and she has like friends around her or something. So the, the model and the body itself is also interacting with this dress. That's always something that uh, in interaction design you try to create a symbiosis with. Another of my designs is for uh, Volkswagen, the, the car company. Um, it is the, the smoke dress and um, the more people are surrounding this dress, the more smoke it evades. So it really puts up an, a sort of a smoke uh, screen. So it is based on another animal uh, from the sea this time, uh, the octopus or the cellopod. Uh, it pushes out ink and it dives away. And I found that notion really uh, interesting. So I put that in this dress. So the more people are around this dress, the more shy, the more almost smoke it evades. And um, here you can see a little bit of that. So there was an, um, an, a collection of eight designs. They were all doing something else, but the smoke dress was sort of the hero um, at that uh, showcase. I think it was 2011, 2012 uh, in Germany. And another of my dresses is the cocktail dress. And it's, uh, it's an, uh, yeah, really creates a cocktail using a peristaltic pump. Let me see what went wrong here. Oh, let's try it one more time. Um, it uh, yeah, really creates a cocktail by the push of a button. There's a peristaltic pump in the back and um, it pushes and it pushes the, the fluids to the front almost. So this design, uh, here you can see the, the peristaltic pump. And that um, I created in 2014 for Cirque du Soleil. They had an, um, an, an restaurant experience in Ibiza called Heart Ibiza. And they asked me and they invited me to create some uh, designs based on uh, the body and technology and uh, interaction design. So I created a series of uh, robotic cocktail dresses, which was really fun. And they were uh, walking around. There was also uh, girls with uh, chewing uh, balls on the, on the shoulders with uh, servos and they, they shoot out these, uh, these chewing gum balls. Sort of and that was really for this uh, yeah, food um, experience in the restaurants. Uh, so that was a really fun experience. Uh, in between there was music, there was art, and there was a lot of uh, things happening around. But with my work, I'm really uh, researching all these spaces, like the social, uh, the playful, like the cocktail dress, the defensive and the behavioral, and the expressive and the, and the sensitive. And I look a lot in the design towards these, these notions. So for example, the, the spider dress has this really sharp v-shape and um yeah and when you interact with it it's a little bit more aggressive so it's really really out there whether for example the smoke dress is uh, much more elegant much more pear shaped and uh, it's also much more like uh, sensitive and, and sensorial almost emotional almost shy um, so i'm really trying to explore this notion and this field of fashion being an interface um, something that can um, express us something that can uh, communicate us and uh, yeah doing so in in a sort of a fashion a fashionable sense so you can think of these inf interfaces as being uh, social as being playful and um, also as being emotional so one of the things that you're thinking about is uh, yeah, data on the body uh, when you're working in, uh, in this field and in this situation. Um, some showcases, this is the tentacle dress that I created for Cirque du Soleil last year. Uh, so that's another, I, I've been doing a few uh, collaborations with Cirque du Soleil, not necessarily for their theater, but for uh, pre-show experiences. And often with uh, other collaborations, it's in this case SAP. So we're using their Qualtrics uh, software um in these uh, in these uh, dresses so you have in front an, uh, a camera and uh, it does facial recognition this uh, this dress and uh, once you are um, smiling it recognizes your facial recognition it uh, it makes a dance or it reacts to your facial expression in this case so another aquatic design
So um, in this case, like we, uh, I'm working with in a, a camera and I'm working with a camera in a closed environment. So um, people in this case with Cirque du Soleil, we can work easy with that because people that are coming in, we can ask, okay, there's a performance coming on, there's a camera involved, you know, it's always nice to talk about that. But there's also cases that you're out in public and that you might want to use an, a camera or like some kind of sensing device. And what is your way about that now uh, in that case? Uh, I, we always talk about technology needing to be non-invasive. So what are ways that you can do that? Uh, for example, working with ultrasonic rangefinders, I find really nice, uh, like the spider dress, for example, um, because they are, for me, less invasive because there's no camera. People don't really feel this notion of they're being recorded and they're also not being recorded in a visual sense, you know. Uh, what I see in my data is a blob, so a sort of an, a blob coming closer to me. Uh, it doesn't have a name, it doesn't have a face almost. Uh, so that's an, a way that sometimes when I work with companies can think of like, okay, you're having a public uh, demonstration or a product, um, how can you work with other things that are maybe not cameras? So this dress is based on these spaces again, and it is my uh, sort of uh, Corona COVID project. So I brought it out um, in March, April, um, because I started to notice that people were taking these uh, reglements regarding to social distancing, not really, um, yeah, sort of really um, um, clear and serious uh, and I noticed that a lot especially in Florida that uh, people sometimes you don't know um, how and how far you are from another person so uh, basically I created a dress based on this notion of sensing the personal space and here you can see the data that I get in from my uh, from my sensors for example and um, also using a thermal camera because the problem what I had what, with my proximity camera is I can see what I say a blob coming in but it doesn't have a name and I don't know how many people. So instead of using a camera which we would solve it, I wanted to work with a non-invasive kind of um, uh, way. So I'm using a thermal sensor in order to designate uh, how many people there are. And then connecting it back to my proximity sensor to see how many people and where they are in my space. So in this case, I'm not using a camera, so being less invasive while still getting my data and the data that I want. So this dress in particular um, really created a physical space. It had these uh, mechanic hip elements and they were standing out to, to create that sort of that boundary for me. Uh, so it was a funny communication thing like, oh, hey, why is your dress doing this? Like you're coming too close to me. Uh, and it was also like a uh, yeah, an, an, uh, different way of, of, uh, for me exploring this notion of uh, personal space again. So then going back to something else, uh, fashion tech and performance, uh, you need to uh, create like really rich systems uh, for performance for like celebrities if they are on stage. Um, my first big thing, like big, big thing was the Super Bowl and that was the first time that I got to America. That was in 2012, I think. I got this call if I wanted to do something for an, uh, a football show. <laughs> and in the Netherlands, a football show is much smaller than you have here in America. So it was 112 million people instead of like a few thousand. Uh, so it was a big shock for me, but it made me really fell in love with Los Angeles and, and after it I was also like living there for a while and, and working uh, there until I moved to San Francisco. So this was the Black Eyed Peas and they, um, they asked me to do Fergie, um, the singer in this case. Uh, so what I was uh, creating was this shield for her and that was... Um, um, based with um, high power uh, LEDs and these LEDs get really uh, hot and uh, instead of building in really big heat sinks I wanted to look for something else so I got uh, in contact with Swarovski and they actually had these uh, metal plated crystals that are actually functioning like an, an, um, yeah, an heat sink almost. And then um, also working with a company in uh, Italy. Uh, they were a lace making company and they um, are recently uh, were looking into more um, uh, like uh, working with electronics and all of that stuff. So we were working with optic fiber. So this is um, like woven on um, a lace making machines, so an old machines with a really futuristic kind of twist to it. So it's optic fiber in, an, uh, in a fabric. So she was wearing those as well. So and these systems need to be like really, really solid, like the, the, the system, the circuit and the battery were in her heel uh, and everything you need to really make really robust because of course it needs to work and it needs to work for longer times as well. So here you can see the, um, the showcase. Uh, Will I Am is created by uh, my friend uh, Jose Fernandez from Iron Hat Studios and he makes all the cool costumes for like Alien, Superman, Tron, uh, uh, Death Punk, who made the helmet. Uh, so he's really cool to look up. It's called Iron Head Studios.
So that is one of the uh, ways that you can think of like, um, yeah, how fashion tech can do cool things uh, on stage. The Super Bowl was a lot of light. So uh, I really needed to make it super, super bright for it to be even visible because you're working with LEDs in circumstances which has a lot of light on stage. Um, so you always need to think of like multiple things. How does this effect really come out well? And in the Super Bowl, it, uh, it definitely did. Um, then the other thing is uh, fashion tech and prosthetics, which I'm super interested in. Uh, I'm collaborating a lot with uh, Victoria Modesta, who is a bionic pop artist, and um, she has some below the knee amputee. So she's using a lot of uh, prosthetic legs. And uh, she's this really uh, interesting person. She's a really ambassador of uh, sort of the disability community saying, uh, uh, with a statement uh, like yeah it's it's uh, it's a cool thing to have all these cool legs and all you know um, so she's really great so you should uh, definitely look her up if you uh, if you don't know her yet um, so I had the opportunity to work with her on I think about six legs in total and um, you can see here I made an, um, a spike that was lighting up for a show last year in Paris. You can see here a collaboration that we did uh, based on the smoke dress, so a smoke leg that she steps in and it starts to smoke. Um, and this is a collaboration that I, um, that I really liked. It's called Sonifica uh, with a friend of mine who was creating these 3D printed instruments and we collaborated together, um, Monat Studio from uh, Miami, uh, in order to find a way that we could combine this 3D printed band also with Victoria and her leg and uh, this uh, tusk design. So there's an accelerometer in her leg. So when she's moving her leg, she makes music and other than um, having uh, for us the accelerometer on the call, for example, it's really uh, set it inside almost where her bone normally is, you know. So it's almost like a ballerina uh, kind of sensation that we can create. So we can create um, different movements. I can see different data um, and we can also make different tones than when it's on your calf or on the outside of your uh, leg almost because it was really center pointed sort of. And uh, she also has this 3D printed tusk design. So together uh, with that, it was a uh, concept, a collaboration that we did for our Miami, our Basel, in 2016. And uh, this is a little bit of an, uh, a process movie in regards to that. I'm Victoria Modesta and I'm a bionic pop artist. You know, with the spike click that I had, it kind of you know, it very much lent itself to using the point of the leg as a kind of circling tool, as a point, as a, as a way of damaging something. But um, with this new leg, it's much more organic and always kind of stomping and kind of animal sort of energy in it. I think that, um, you know, when we get to the stage where we get into that final kind of um, performance character it's actually probably going to be a surprise to me just as much as it will be to you because um it's like it's it's i guess it's like exploring an identity that this new equipment and silhouette will sort of give me So we did that in three locations, in the World Symphony Theater at FICE, at the FICE um, head office and, and another location with an uh, Saha Hadith sculpture, but I forgot the place that I was. So that was really interesting to do it at uh, three totally different locations as well. Um, and then another project um, was with Rolls Royce, uh, was actually last December. And I will show you the, just the beginning and then so um it's a it's a long clip so you should uh, look it um up it's called uh, black batch uh, victoria modesta you can find it um and for this clip in particular we want to work with or um, i want to work with uh, the notion of like um uh, like energy and so i collaborated with um uh, two specialists in uh, specialists in uh, tesla coils and together uh, joe and uh, john the prima of architect uh, they do shows with like really big uh, tesla coils and together we created like really small uh, tesla coil uh, that uh, that i could then um, put into uh, the leg and then uh, we could put into the shoe so i'm going to first show you the clip and then i'm going to show you um, a little bit about um, yeah how we did that
So what you can see in there um, is uh, the leg itself, and I have a little bit of there. Um, What I love about working with Victoria is she's just such a badass. She's not scared of anything. And for me, this lack is really resembling that notion of Victoria. It's an opportunity to put a lot of like, cool technology in there. And in this case, a really tiny uh, Tesla coil uh, in the heel of the shoe. So the lag that does something that is not there just for the function, it also has the function of being a sort of a technological marvel. This is the Raid Karma Fiber from uh, Rolls Royce, which was for me a really interesting process because it's something that I have not worked with before. So the frontal part has the engine of the, um, of the black badge, really merging technology and fashion in such a different way. So that was a little bit like the, the yeah the commercial. Um, they had some uh, interviews with me. So the um, yeah the designer, the, the artist Victoria, and also the producer, uh, which was um, uh, Jora uh, Franz, uh, who's a great producer. So it was basically all a girls' team, which was really fun. Uh, was really interesting, and that uh, got released because of their uh, yeah new car came out. So um, a little bit uh, behind that, is my presentation is a lot of noise, but. <laughs> So this is a little bit like the early prototyping, which you can see to the to the um, uh, left. You can see the shoe uh, that uh, we collaborate on with United Mute, uh, Remco has, uh, who is also Dutch. And so you can see the Tesla coil in the back of the shoe. The um, electronics are in the shoe. You can see it in the little uh, door there. And I also have a better view here. So that's... Um, That part, that like little wire, is being uh, connected to the leg up, and then it creates uh, what we call a Jacob's ladder effect of that electricity jumping around. So everything is built in the shoe, and every like really every little space in that uh, design and in the leg has really been used and utilized in order to create for this uh, this design. And uh, the design itself, um, what I recently a lot to do is with Victoria is um, I call it a ghost leg. I hope I can stop this for a second. I call it sort of almost a ghost lacking where uh, we take out the, the inner space of the design and that's where the, um, the effect happens. And that's a really cool thing because almost where the bone normally is, this is what I use for this, uh, this effect to happen. And she's only leaning on the two outsides of this uh, prosthetic leg. So those are a little bit... Um, and I'm gonna go to the next one. Those are a few uh, brand collaborations. Uh, Rolls Royce was um, last December, uh, so that's a more recent project. Uh, this was for Audi in 2015. They had their new car coming out, the A4, and they asked me to make a collection uh, based on that. Um, um, so you can see a little bit of the um, of the early prototyping, the lights, um, using high power LEDs uh, that are normally to be found in the car. So yeah, engineer system of that to put it on the body. And so the, the shield fringe is also like a sort of an, um, an heat sink um, as well. So here you can see some of that in the, uh, we were doing some tests in regards to a dark space and how it would look um, at in the end on the, uh, on the stage for Audi. And here you can see some of the development. There was also one ID. I haven't worked it out yet. I would love to do that. Uh, one ID that first crunches out and then the lights uh, start to shine through. The projection map dress here uh, that I'm showing now, uh, we really used in a setting uh, that uh, you'll see in the, in the clip. So it was these different skins that were being projected while they were walking around sort of. Um, and that you can see here.
So that was um, Audi, um, AD, and so uh, for me, working with brands, it's really about uh, like yeah, looking at uh, where is my research as a designer, where is my um, uh, yeah sort of the things that I like that I want to explore, and also uh, where is that uh, DNA of the company? So where is your identity mixing with these ideas that you are discussing with uh, the companies and the brands that I uh, collaborate with? And for me, it's really important to really deep dive in there and really go broad. Um, because in the end you both have a project that you are really proud of and a collaboration that is really uh, yeah, doing something and, and really communicating these things in a uh, yeah, correct way. So I think it's always really important that this uh, DNA mixes with your own identity because if you have a project that uh, you might like but the client doesn't, like that's not a match or the client really likes but you're like, mm, yeah, I just did that sort of, you know, that's, that's not what we're going for in the end. You really want something that you're proud of yourself uh, and also the client, of course. Um, so I think that's an, um, a really important thing of my design um, yeah, philosophy. And it's also about blurring the lines, you know, uh, working with uh, the, like different teams, uh, like what is fashion, what is design, what is architecture, uh, what is uh, what is a disability. Um, and I think like, yeah, from the artist uh, point of view, I think you can do um, a lot of interesting things with that. So the last topic uh, that I want to go into is um, that I'm not only doing things with the surroundings, the most of the products that I'm showing now are having to do with the surroundings. Um, a, a lot of what I do is uh, connected to the body, so you can think of uh, EEG, um, uh, BVP, uh, EMG, so um, uh, muscle contraction, EDA, cofanic skin response, uh, respiration, the way you're breathing is uh, really interesting if you're looking at emotional data, uh, where you have heart rate and heart volume, so uh, HRV um, is interesting as well, but it's a little bit more or uh, yeah, sort of controlled where respiration the data is really like uh, symbiotic uh, when you look at it. So I think that's a really interesting uh, notion of getting emotional data from that. So all of these sensors um, can be, or all of these, uh, these um, yeah, sort of research uh, topics can be um, uh, linked to uh, gathering data in, from a different point on the body. So EEG, of course, the brain is here, galvanic screen response, muscle contraction uh, might be here, while heart rate you want to have in your um, heart area, for example, you know. So these, um, all these sensors want to live in different places on the body almost and what you can do then um, if you have a sensoric system that is measuring your uh, emotion it's just illustrative data of course uh, like it's uh, it measures your emotion and what's going on your anxiety your stress uh, uh, whatever we're measuring here um, if there's also for example cameras you also have like sort of computer vision notion of okay we see what we are doing here and also um, uh, like the notion of who is in this space sort of you know so these are for example factors that I'm always uh, trying to research so um, talking about EEG uh, this is one of the products that is really dear to me. Um, it is, uh, was the first design that was not uh, really based on fashion and uh, using a model and all of that stuff. I did an um, artist residency for Ars Electronica, which is a big media institute in Linz in uh, Austria. And um, uh, I wanted to create, other than a dress, uh, with these uh, technologies in there, I want to create a device. And I wanted to work with uh, children that are having ADHD. So kids that uh, might be a little bit more excited for the world uh, around them and, and that has a different effect on them, sort of, you know. And um, in our world, sometimes a lot of uh, people say, okay, this uh, child needs medication. And I think that uh, can be a really uh, non-effective way because it can really uh, do a lot of damage to the child in some cases, uh, you know. So for me, sometimes I like to explore uh, what, is, uh, what is else there, you know, uh, what, what else can we use. And I came up with this uh, device, a BCI, so a brain-computer interface that is able to uh, record the brain signals of the P300. I'm going to explain a little bit about that. And um, also having a camera in there. So the camera is reacting to whenever the focus state goes on from uh, this child or the wearer, I uh, can also wear it myself. And um, whenever this camera goes on, um, it knows that I'm in focus and it records whatever is happening around me. Uh, so in, a, in the best case is uh, you go to a an, an zoo and uh, at the end of the day, you see all the animals that you really liked and the ice cream that you really liked and you saw people and colors and you heard your name, all of that stuff, anything that brings that focus to you. And for me, it's a discussion point of the child um, and in this situation, like to go back and to say like, hey, see like that anything and everything around you has this effect on you, you know? And um, I think the more um, these kids know uh, what is going on in their brain they're first of all like super curious about that and it always uh, also gives them more awareness of, of why uh, yeah sort of uh, synapses are firing as they do sort of you know 
So it's called Asian Unicorn. Um, so you can see here some of the, um, the early developments, the camera uh, in the design. In this case, I'm uh, using it in, an, uh, in a room uh, with, uh, with, uh, yeah, with uh, the parents and people um, around it as well. And uh, this was uh, some of the early demoing. But it was really for me to look at what, what we can see using this camera in that in that, in that time. little abrupt ending <laughs> but uh, but yeah so that that's a little bit like yeah um, I want to create an um, yeah sort of the headset where you have like a, an extra set of eyes um, in this case there and the research is centered about this uh, the P3 wave uh, of uh, ERP and that's more medical uh, EEG but um, researching only these uh, this set of um, electrodes instead of uh, 64 electrodes that you can see here on the head um, uh, make me uh, adjust the design a little bit more so it's not a full head it's a little bit less invasive for the child because in the end it really became a device um, and I think you can see here one of them two of them uh, sitting in my studio behind me uh, it really became a device that the, the child can put on and also put off whenever they want to you know and I think that's really important uh, creating these BCIs almost so you can see here the um, some of the early development of that um, that headset and also the placement of the um, the P300 uh, in there and those were exactly the ones, the points that I needed for uh, focus in this case. So um, yeah, cutting that back, making that go back to uh, only the use of eight electrodes uh, on the head. And you can see here some of the headset, the system is in the back. And uh, here's the, <laughs> the more crude version of the, the early prototypes. But there you can also see the, um, the electrodes and, uh, and all of that stuff. So that's um, later on the company that I did this uh, research with. So it was Ars Electronica and also GTEC, which is a medical uh, EEG company. And um, at the same time that I was doing this um, and said like, okay, I cannot work with a an, uh, an really expensive medical system, which is over 10,000. And also the commercially available devices that I have uh, are mostly doing um, yeah, EMG. So it's more from uh, like the way you use your uh, eye movements and all of that stuff. Sometimes for me, it's more muscle contraction than really going deep diving into this uh, P300 wave in this case, what I wanted to do. At the same time, this uh, company was also looking into uh, more creating a device that was more prone to um, uh, be uh, interesting for makers and people all over the globe, sort of. So, um, Aging Unicorn and uh, yeah, some of the early developments of this um, eight electrode system uh, came to be uh, this device. So, it's Unicorn uh, Stripebi.com and it's a uh, brain computer interface that is um, about 1000 instead of like yeah, the 10,000 that it normally would be. Um, and uh, this is most, mostly going through uh, DTEC. Um, so it's a, like a more better available system. It's medical EG, so that's really cool to work with. Um, you really yeah, can, can do things um, and you really get uh, a clear feedback on, on what you do because it's, um, it's well connected and also the software. Uh, in that. And then the other thing that uh, with GTEC we're doing, and especially GTEC is doing this part, but um, if you do want to get to know and work with EEG and um, BCIs, um, there's also a hackathon. So it's called Brain.io. So it's inspired by, um, by sort of Aging Unicorn, and it is in, uh, in a lot of cities. So um, if you want to get yourself involved with like BCI and EEG, you might want to like check this website sometimes and then you can take part of this, um, yeah, sort of hackathon. Uh, it's mostly 24 hours and it's a really fun thing. I've, I've been to a few of them and uh, yeah, we, uh, my part's more the design and the BCI design and working with that sort of. So that's a really uh, cool thing that you might want to keep in mind. And also the open BCI community is interesting if you want to look more into uh, EEG and uh, all of that stuff. Uh, that is uh, open source BCI. Um, yeah, people that that are yeah doing a lot of things and also yeah putting it online and all of all of that. So that comes to my last um, project, which launched um, last last Monday, and we presented it this weekend in uh, in Austria. Uh, unfortunately, I could not be there, but I was there uh, online, so it was my night time. <laughs> so that's why I have the dark spots under my eyes. And so Amanda uh, already uh, named this. Uh, it's the Pangolin Skills uh, BCI and Dress. <clears throat> and here we're going a step back because um, in Aging Unicorn, we're using eight electrodes. Normal setup is 64 electrodes for medical EG. 
um, now we're using uh, 64 um, PCBs, uh, but each PCB has 16 channels. So we're using uh, 1024 channels, which is a lot. Um, the interesting thing with, um, with this versus like, of course, in 64 um, um, yeah, sort of uh, channel BCI is that you cannot detect. You can see maybe that you're lifting your right or your left arm uh, and that's it. But if the more channels you have and the more resolution like uh, we have here now, um, you can even see the fingers move, for example, you know. Um, so this is a development with, um, again, GTEC and also Johannes Kepler University uh, in Linz for Ars Electronica. And um, then um, my main part is also connecting this to uh, what can you showcase, how can you showcase this. So I created this dress uh, based on the 64 um, outputs. So you have the 64 inputs from the BCI and then the 64 outputs from the dress. So um, it is connected uh, to uh, yeah, the, the EEG in real time and the dress is uh, basically showcasing this. So it showcases um, any of these uh, channels. So that was the dress. Uh, so the setup, like this is an easy sketch of uh, like creating this exoskeleton and um, basically hosting all these like little, uh, little parts, all these actuators in there. And um, there's a movie online that, that explains it all. Um, the average human brain contains about 86 billion nerve cells called neurons. Neurons communicate with each other by sending chemical and electrical signals. These neurons communicate in unique ways, and covering how the human brain sends signals to our body has been for long one of the biggest mysteries in science. Researchers from the Johannes Kepler University in Linz teamed up with me, Anouk Wiprecht, and neurotechnology company GTEC to create an eccentric international collaboration in where art, fashion, science and technology gets combined. Using the pangolin as inspiration, we were able to create ultra-small EEG sensors that look like pangolin scales. Using 1024 EEG sensors on the head, with 24 bits from 1024 locations, covering the full brain, and 64 actuators combined in one pangolin dress. We can now see the brain in a never-before-seen resolution. The pangolin system is fitted onto our model to extract commands through the use of EEG in order to control the actuators of the dress while unlocking hidden information from her brain. The dress in turn reacts to the input signals from the brain and visualizes this data through motion and light corresponding to each of the 1024 data points. This input-output situation and feedback loop gives us more insight to evaluate and research the electrical activity within the brain. Is it not only true? Oops, okay. There's something going wrong with my videos, but you can, uh, hmm, weird. You can, uh, you can see this uh, pangolin BCI, like the, the movie. So as you could see already, like one of the things that, uh, that we still have is a lot of um, HDMI cables <laughs> for, the, for, the, like, uh, sort of for the resolution and to have that all work well, because otherwise you don't know. So we're still um, working on that. Like the next step for that is also making those uh, wireless, uh, but um, that takes a little bit of uh, development. So uh, that's the thing that uh, we'll definitely be working on um, uh, yeah, in the next period of time. Uh, we presented it at Ars Electronica, the three days, uh, the model was there. And um, yeah, it's just really um, interesting to see like how she's able to control the dress better 
uh, the more days, of course, like she's working with that sort of, you know, it's almost a training system. Uh, so that's a really nice thing. If you have, uh, yeah, Maggie, our model that you could see with all the tattoos, uh, she was there. She was with us for a few days and it's really nice to see those fluctuations and um, that she can, uh, yeah, animate the dress um, much more and much faster with her uh, using her brain. <clears throat> so the, the product has a lot of, um, yeah, sort of, uh, uh, yeah great press a lot of people are interested in sort of the mind reading uh, capabilities um we were a little bit afraid that it might be very technical you know but um like yeah all the technology partners everybody uh yeah they really liked it and they they described it really well uh sometimes you you are too technical yourself you try to explain it and then this really pretty media article comes out and explains it much better than, than we ever did sort of you know so that's really interesting to read um and that is a little bit, uh, yeah, the end of my presentation. So it's a lot of, um, yeah, the fashion element is in there, the architecture, the design elements, uh, interaction design, uh, broad knowledge on, uh, yeah, coding, programming, uh, sensors, a uh, lot of uh, collaborative efforts. Sometimes I work alone. Uh, sometimes I work in, an, um, yeah, with, with collaborators, uh, brands, partners, um, especially Pangolin Dress was uh, me, GTEC, and JKU. I never did a sort of a three-way collaboration, uh, but it's, uh, yeah, it works out really well. So that was really interesting. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit my life. And I think also this is only a portion of the dresses. I have over like 100 dresses uh, and products that are all based in a different way uh, on technology and also connected in a different way to the body. Uh, so that's a little bit my mysterious, uh, mysterious world of things. Very cool. Um, I've been getting lots of comments and pings that it's just mind blowing some of the stuff that you're doing. This is super cool. Um, we have a few questions and I encourage people in the remaining 10-ish or we could even go over a little bit uh, minutes to feel free to ping questions either in the chat, um, you know, or in the Q&A. Um, let me start, I guess, um, you know, one question um, from Joyce Ogi was just kind of the concept of smart clothing. So a lot of what you're doing is, you know, clothing that's re responding to the wearer. Um, and now it seems like we could actually have clothing that's learning based on user behaviors, actions over time. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about kind of the AI elements of, um, you know, clothes that are actually learning and responding um, to the user over time. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's really interesting. Um, I think I always say like, yeah, garments that know that you're stressed before you do. I, I mean, that's that's great. Um, if it's a wearable, um, uh, that that's something. It's it's just a bleep or a peep or something in your screen. But what if your um, if your garments can really organically uh, respond to you and and your world around you? You know, I think that's always a very nice thing. Um, Using a lot of like, uh, yeah, things like uh, like little actuators uh, to calm you down. Maybe um, I think the the topic of like anxiety and just the skin, the epidermis, you know, is is not really explored too much. Maybe, and you can do a lot with smart fabrics and all of that stuff. Um, and so, yeah, also the AI machine learning elements, of course, in there. Uh, I mean, it's an it's a field that has not been existing for too long because um, definitely like technology was not as small and uh, maybe washable and and all the things that we um, we are now working with, you know. And also the projects that I'm showing, showcasing now are a little bit more artistic, so more art and science times fashion uh, kind of collaborations, because I thought it was just interesting to show. I work also a lot with, uh, with companies and to really uh, yeah, go into deep dive on the sensors and the connection to the body sort of, which I think is, uh, is really uh, interesting from multiple ways. Again, think of like non-invasive ways that you can do, which I try to explain with the camera, uh, for example, you know, um, and so also, uh, yeah, some, some things that really uh, create a good symbiosis between the technology and the, and the human aspects as well. Great, and another question from uh, Jorge Montalvo is, you know, it seems like well, first of all, I have a question. Can can any of these pieces be bought in retail or are these all kind of more experimental one-off? And then uh, his question was, you know, how could this be more mass marketed? Is it the materials, textures, cost, complexity, manufacturing? Um, you know, is it is this any of this commercially available or is it more on the conceptual level today? 
Yeah, uh, I'm definitely more of a conceptual designer because I like it. I like, I'm a partially tinker, partially like sort of, uh, yeah, busy with fashion. Um, the Unicorn BCI is a product that you can buy uh, right now, sort of, you know, so that's the BCI, brain computer interface part. Um, fabrics, not so much because I'm always having uh, projects mostly lined up. So, and it's always a brand collaboration. Sometimes it's projects. Um, my, my problem, I think, is that I never get an, a, a lot of money for a longer time. I get money and it's a, it's a one two month process sort of you know so often these uh, these designs uh, either step um, uh, and I work fast and I work um, uh, good sort of you know but um, from that point on um, there's not necessarily discussion on reproducing it's just the ex discussion of exploring um, exploring this new field um, um, how it can be connected how I can work with piece of technology sort of you know so it's not necessarily that I work on like development over years I do that in stages like I, I use uh, the, the BCI in Agent Unicorn and then and now this project again like uh, one year later two years later I work again with EG and for that for me like my research is really uh, going in depth by uh, using it uh, that way sort of you know so it's often uh, like more research um, collaborations and, and efforts sort of you know that uh, that really trigger one specific point then uh, that I'm really uh, creating for mass markets uh, I must say that other things like if you have jackets with LEDs that's cool you know that's more made for mass market but how are you kind of mass market robotics you know I think that's an interesting point if you have soft robotics uh, like there's a lot of field to explore and I think that's gonna happen uh, that just not not happen because my ideas are pretty far out sometimes you know uh, but they're all talking about this new symbiotic relationship with uh, with technology and then uh, the question of uh, Jorke is uh, what is missing for tech fashion to be mass marketed is it about materials texture cost complexity in manufacturing um, yeah I think like there's a lot of things uh, if you think about the field again I show you like the more artistic things uh, today um, you can talk about washability of course uh, the one enemy of <laughs> technology and electronics is water um, so yeah I know that a lot of washing machine companies are interested in in this and uh, they are um, developing actually washing machines that you can wash your electronic textiles in um, I am on a project for next year uh, which has to do with flexible uh, 3d printed um, um, yeah textiles and fabrics uh, which I think is interesting uh, from that notion uh, which I haven't explored yet so that's my first time that I'm, I'm gonna really do that um, so washability um what happens if, uh, if uh, yeah, I sell you a dress and it breaks, you know? I'm really interested in the do-it-yourself community. So you might uh, have something, you make it yourself uh, based on my, my schematics or something and it breaks, but you also know how to reprogram and all. So I think that's a really cool community uh, myself. Uh, but what if I uh, sell you uh, a spider dress and it breaks? Are you witty enough to make that, to fix it yourself, you know, or reprogram some of the code? Uh, do you go to, uh, yeah, do you send it back or do you go to an electronic dressmaker in the city you know so there's a lot of uh, that stuff um, um, as well you know if you have an, um, your lamp uh, breaks uh, you buy a new one uh, so what is that in between you know and I think there's a lot of discussion about that so maintaining the designs so that's the second one um, yeah so battery is the third one uh, batteries are mostly pretty clunky they're not organic um, if I work with PCBs as well I make them always round printed circuit boards uh, so what is the next generation of, of batteries that that is going out there you know that's coming out there to to help uh, because especially when you work with robotics you need to have and uh, yeah you need to have a lot of volume <laughs> with regards to your batteries you know um, and so what are solutions there so I think there's a lot of um, problems but there's also a lot of discussion and I think uh, yeah that makes it just really interesting because the topics that were a problem when I started this in the beginning of 2000 are discussable now but that has not been for too long that has been maybe since 2012 you know uh, so that's again it's a fairly new field and I think a lot of um, interest is there also from fashion brands and technology companies but there's definitely there needs uh, to be a lot more uh, like research uh, yeah in this field sort of in order to uh, to to make it boom and to make it available like that interesting we have a, another question from um ren scott who was interested about your thoughts on how to capture emotion with respiration um mm -hmm. you kind of mentioned um the camera taking images as another way to capture context um and you know when accessing those images taken you know what usually do you find to be most interesting and this person was asking um you know what are the trends over time and you know could people actually be wearing clothes that would then help them remember 
where they were, who they're with, how they felt mm -hmm. in that moment. And yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think regarding to emotions, uh, people are like uh, under the knowledge that we can detect emotions very well and already available, but that's still a hard thing. Like uh, sometimes you're measuring, try to measure emotions. Um, is this person aroused or scared? You know, so there's a lot of uh, in between and almost you need to have a secondary question like, hey, is this true? You know, so like maybe a machine learning aspect in there. Um, so you can recognize a lot, but um, yeah, the same with brain computer interfaces. We knew that you move this arm or this arm we are able to to understand now that we can move and which finger we move you know um so i think that is much more um interesting from the um emotional side as well there's an um a company um in um uh, lisbon from yuga yugo silva it's called plux inc um and they um they are creating a system and that's always my mindset you need to create a system that has multiple points on your body that you measure multiple things with at the same time and reflect that to each other what is the brain doing? What is the um, respiration doing? You know, uh, what's your lung volume? Uh, how is the heart reacting to this? And not like, okay, what data is coming in, but how do they react to each other? And I think if you are able to create that system, you can have a better notion on what an emotion is rather than uh, cutting the data out how you see it sort of, and that's often being done sort of. And I think it's more, what I say, interesting conversation of, of, of how that listens to each other and how it reacts to each other uh, almost in a way. A um, couple of questions, um, people interested in if you can recommend any courses into smart fashion or wearables, then also if you take interns, somebody was so inspired they would like to come work with you. And then I guess the third part of the question is, you know, some of the tools you use, um, maybe a little bit more specific, but the Maya Fusion 360, are there others? So I guess, yeah, courses, uh, internships, and tools that you use. <laughs> How to get started, yeah. Um, <laughs> blend people's questions together. <laughs> yeah. Well, communities are important. Uh, it's a little bit more make site, sort of, you know, but uh, hackster.io is a really cool hardware hack uh, kind of community uh, that you might want to look into. Bill already named it instructables.com. Uh, yeah, you can, you, you can find a lot of like do-it-yourself projects. I did in the past, I did a few of them on there. Um, you can think of, uh, yeah, there's a lot of communities. Open BCI, if you're interested in uh, EEG um, and all of that stuff. Um, join hackathons, go to your local makerspaces. Um, um, with regards to studies, um, I mean, I know uh, a bunch. I have a list of them. I cannot pull them up right now. Um, I know that there are a lot of studies I get asked also like to... Um, uh, more and more to teach so it's really more opening up uh, when i was studying in the beginning of 2000 there was no course it was either fashion design or interaction design or robotics you know and it's really nice that there's a lot of hybrids now at this at this point of time so there's a lot of that uh, i might be able to post it somewhere later on uh, like a list of that um, other tools, oh, tools. Um, well, uh, yeah, coding, you can think of like uh, Arduino, Python, uh, like there's different languages that you can um, that you can do things in. You can first prototype and then have it based, be based on a different board if you want to start coding and doing things with that, uh, making connected things or uh, whatever. You can start with Arduinos or Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi Zero is kind of cute. It's in like a smaller one uh, if you still want to work with video. Uh, design uh, software, you can think of more uh, parametric like Rhino, uh, you have Grasshopper plugin, you have plugins that you can connect uh, technology to it, which is, I think, is interesting. Uh, you can think of Autodesk, uh, Maya, uh, sort of the, the more 3D, uh, like, uh, yeah, if, it depends really on what, what your skill set is and where, you, where you're coming from. You have Fusion 360, which is a little bit more um, better available also for students. Uh, that uh, that, uh, that uh, Autodesk has a software, an open source software, which I'm interested in is uh, Blender. It's created by a Dutch guy um, and it gets much more attraction in also the architectural design uh, scene. Uh, so that's Blender and that's open source. So I think there's a lot of like from open source to uh, software that you um, need to pay for. And I would always say if you get, uh, get interested in it, first go open source and then yeah, start to pay into <laughs> whatever program you want sort of, you know, um, and also look at designers around you what they are using um, and all of that stuff as well. Great and I think we can move this um, into a smaller discussion but I just wanted to ask like one last question and then we'll kind of move into a smaller group um, catch up but um, just curious like so when you get a new project like from Ars Technica like what's your creative process how do you how, how, like how, how do you go from you know getting kind of a spec okay or, or, or like Cirque du Soleil, so, okay, we want to design us these dress for heart. And then how do you get from there to, you know, your final product? What, 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 what inspires you? 
Uh, well, the most fun projects is that the brand just comes to you and they say, we know that you're a specialist in whatever you do. We want to work with you. What do you have in mind? And in the beginning, I was always like, ah, you know, but uh, now I start to understand like, okay. And I'm always like, okay, what? Yeah, like you, you start to explore whatever or you take something, I have a big, big broad thing, so things that I want to do in regards to my research. And then you just start to see like, okay, what can be interesting? What, uh, du Soleil, what can we do in an open space to have audience interaction uh, with a car brand? What can we do with your interior? How can we connect? Um, how we can work with smart textiles, you know, or um, there's always yeah, a way that, that you can say like, okay, these are some ideas and then you just yeah, have a discussion first. And then the second part would be like uh, prototyping and demoing it out because is what you want to do, is that uh, possible, technically possible from a design point of view, from uh, the looks of it, whatever, you know? So you need to prove that out. So you, you start to uh, prototype. So I start to uh, build uh, robotics or start to uh, in, try to create some interactions. And then how does it look like is the next step you know how is this all going to look like so that's the design phase and uh, either architectural fabric uh, whatever that can be and then you are at a point that you can say okay this is sort of the proposal and this is something that we that we can do and that's also feasible and it's also feasible in this certain amount of time because uh, yeah what's the time what's the budget and all of that stuff is also important um, and by that if you have this red line through there you know um, a sketch is always like a red line that that guides you because during your design process it's like oh that's cool oh that's cool oh that's cool and that is something that is really guiding you like okay no we're on this track you know because you're always curious like where everybody's curious so I think it's a lot of uh, back and forth and what I always say you always have different hats on uh, you look at it from the hat of the engineer how should this work you look at it from the uh, the hat of the designer how does this look like uh, from the fashion designer or you know um, and and you always need to go spiral through all of these things having different views from different fields almost um, that's always, I think, important uh, to create something that, that matches um, either an, an art and science and technology collaboration versus something more commercial for brands uh, versus an experience or something like that. So, and I think that is, uh, it's scary, I think, sometimes, uh, and especially in the beginning, but if you do it like longer time, uh, it's actually really fun and, and it's really, uh, yeah, it's, it's really playful sometimes as well, the, the creative process. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. For people that are on, if you want to stay on, we'll stop the recording and then go into a smaller Zoom room to catch up. We can probably go for maybe, you know, 10 or so minutes more. But um, just want to thank you again, Anouk. Um, it was a wonderful presentation. Uh, super interesting. Um, I've, I've been really enjoying watching your Vimeo videos and following all the press that you've been getting for the Pangolin dress. So congratulations on that. Um, we will have this recording up on the website soon. Um, and then just a quick plug, our next Fireside Chats in two weeks on Wednesday, September 30th. Uh, with Roem Garagozlu, who is the founder and CEO of Dapper Labs. Um, they're the creator of CryptoKitties. Um, and they are also working upcoming titles like the MBA Top Shot and Flow Blockchain. So we'll talk about um, you know, what they're doing in the blockchain space and how they're reinventing you know, a new model for digital collectibles and truly transforming what it means to be a fan. Um, so, you can register on our upcoming uh, webinars on the Acti website, um, acti.global. And until our next fireside chat, I hope you all stay healthy and inspired and hope to see you on our next one. Thank you. <laughs>